we're now live on Facebook. You can go ahead. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Before we get started, we would like to ask Gilbert Martinez uh, from the uh, Sonoma County Communications team to offer a quick message for our Spanish speaking viewers. Gilbert. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a la sesión informativa. Esta sesión informativa se está transmitiendo en vivo por nuestro canal de YouTube por interpretación al español. Para escuchar la, la versión en español, puede usar el link de YouTube que se encuentra en la página de Facebook del Condado de Sonoma. Además, esta sesión informativa se, está, se va a presentar de nuevo y completamente en español este jueves a las 4 por, uh, por nuestra página de Facebook. Gracias. Y ahora regresamos para atrás con Paul Gullickson. All right. Thank you, Gilbert. Welcome, everybody. I'm Paul Gullickson, Communications Manager for the County of Sonoma. And we'd like to welcome all of you to this joint community briefing for Tuesday, August 10th, involving the Sonoma County Office of Education and the Sonoma County Department of Health Services. Our focus today is on the COVID pandemic and the reopening of schools and what te parents, teachers, staff, and most of all students can expect as classrooms begin to reopen this week. To help address our, uh, your questions, we want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today, including Dr. Steve Harrington, Sonoma County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Sundry Mace, uh, Sonoma County's Health Officer, Dr. Irmala Shende, the County's Vaccine Chief, Dr. Kismet Baldwin, our Deputy Health Officer, Kate Pack, Sonoma County's Lead Epidemiologist. All of them will be taking part in a, our, our brief presentation that will cover uh, where we stand in our COVID pandemic and how we have prepared our classrooms. I'd also like to introduce uh, my counterpart, Jamie Hansen, the Director of Communications for the Sonoma County Office of Education. We'll be overseeing and, and moderating our question and answer panel at the very end. In addition, to help us address the questions from the public and the media, uh, I'd like to introduce um, our other panelists, including Adam Radke, a Sonoma County Deputy County Counsel, Dania Candela, the Sonoma County Health Equity Manager, and our, our public health nurses from the schools team, including Kira Ockenden, Laurel Ockenden, Diane Koval, Paloma Angle, and Jenny Strait. We thank you all for being here and helping us today. Uh, finally, we'd like to just remind you that if you have a, I'd like to ask a question of our panel, you're welcome to just post it on the comments area of the Facebook page or the YouTube page, depending on where you're watching. You're also invited to email questions to communications at scoe.org. -E That's communications at scoe.org. And we have staff uh, ready to pose these questions to pass them along to our panelists. So, uh, uh, and but we will get to questions in a little bit. With now, I'd like to pass the baton to Dr. Steve Harrington. Dr. Harrington. Thank you, Paul. Um, and <clears throat> to both parents and students, welcome back to another school year. I wanna thank you uh, for your participation today. As I'm sure many people would like to know what the conditions are for this school year. Last year's conditions were primarily shelter and protect. This year's conditions have changed as it relates to the reopening of school. We are, for next slide, Kim, I'm gonna look at the, nav. we're gonna navigate these changes together because the changes are basically dealing with a new uh, a directive from the California Department of Public Health. First of all, the directives by the California Department of Public Health address both public, private, and charter schools. And that all entities that are in the school education field need to follow the guidance of the California Department of Public Health. And we've learned through the year, last year and the year and the half year before that, that the guidance changes as the conditions change. And we anticipate that the guidance will change as the conditions change this year. I would like to let you know that SCO, the Sonoma County Office of Education, works closely with the health experts and the school communities. There are 40 school districts and it is SCO's responsibility to communicate to those 40 districts we meet with Dr. Mace weekly and her legal team to go over the changes of conditions or to answer operational questions as it relates to school safety and health. We will keep you posted as the changes happen, but we encourage parents to read the guidance at ourschools.covid19california.gov. 
www.ncpa.gov. And I also like to encourage you to look at your school site, each school site webpage, because every school will post their COVID safety plan. And that's required of all public, private, and charter schools that maintain a website, they need to post their plan for public review. So I encourage you to start there in your local school setting. Next slide. This fall, as I said, the focus is on in-person learning and the state's priority as directed in the legislation passed by the, the gov and signed by the governor is that all students must have access to a safe full-time instruction and as much instructional time as possible and practical. Next slide. What are their new conditions? Well, the changes have changed and the conditions have changed. Masks of all students and staff, staff must be worn indoors unless they're medically exempt. Some schools may require masking outdoors as well. And that's because of the contact tracing requirements. Quarantine, if masks are worn, children do not have to stay home from school if they are exposed to a COVID-19 case in their classroom if they were masked. So that's a change from last year. And the change for this year is that there is no longer distance, social distancing. We will have full-time in-person instruction. So with the elimination of social distancing, we no longer have to have small classes so we can have full class sizes as well as long as we follow the masking, universal masking requirement. Next. Why masks? Well, I've covered a little bit of it. It's to protect the unvaccinated children that we have in grades TK through age 12, which is usually sixth grade. It's to prevent outbreaks and quarantine with uni for universal masking. It's to enable full-time in-person learning to have universal masking. And it eliminates the need for social distancing, which was required last year. So that is the reason we, we are following a universal masking policy. Now, masks outdoors, that's the choice of the local district. Some are choosing to follow it to extend the protection to children and families. Next slide. Parent, what can parents and guardians do? Well, first of all, always self-screen before you send your child to school. Encourage your child age 12 or older to get a vaccine and ensure age eligible family members to also be vaccinated. Most kids are exposed at home in a home school at a home setting. Our school ex exposure has been very, very low there. I don't believe there's a, any reported case. It's not that we don't have cases in school, but the contact did not occur in school. So get your student tested regularly and we encourage students to wear a mask at all times. Next. For those of you who have concern about sending your child back, the state has created a new option for parents. First of all, there is no longer distance learning. The program you had last year, where there was synchronous and asynchronous instruction, in which there was scheduled time and consequence for the amount of time, that has been re re uh, released and that law no longer is in place. What has been, it has been replaced with the independent study. And all schools and districts must offer an option to parents. The parent may choose the independent study for their families. If the school district is not size by size capable of offering independent study, then you can talk to your school or district to learn about your options. You can go to a neighboring district that is offering independent study. So the districts may have inter-district agreements for that purpose, or they may have secured a contractor to provide independent study for the students. Currently, most of our high schools have completed this. Parents are being surveyed to see what type of program option they wish to follow. Elementaries are currently doing it to see what program type options to follow. So please make your selection. And once you've made your selection, work with your district. But remember, last year's all students out on a distance learning program will not be offered this year. It will be a modified program known as independent study. Next. I think Dr. Mace, these next set of slides will be yours. Or someone from your staff, anyway. <laughs> I 
think we'll start with Dr. Mays first. You can have some introductory comments and then we'll do our slides. Dr. Mays. Great, uh, thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, Dr. Harrington. As uh, Dr. Harrington said, the Public Health Department has been in regular meetings with the Sonoma County Office of Education for the past year as we've all been uh, striving through this pandemic. We really appreciate being invited to participate in this discussion about the reopening of schools. This indeed has been a challenge in 18 months for all of us, students, parents, educators, administrators, and healthcare providers alike. We're proud to say that throughout this time, the County Department of Health Services has worked closely with GO, as I just said, to provide the most up-to-date information and guidance possible so that the Office of Education and individual school districts can make the most informed decisions possible about protocols for a safe return to the classroom. We are concerned about the recent surge in cases that we're experiencing here in Sonoma County, a surge driven largely by the spread of the Delta variant, primarily among those who are unvaccinated in Sonoma County. That said, we want to make clear that we continue to support the return to full-time in-person instruction while also doing everything we can to ensure that students and parents alike feel comfortable and assure the classrooms are safe. One thing is certain, for students 12 and older, the best thing they can do to stay safe is to get vaccinated. As we'll cover in a few minutes when we go through our slides, our case rate here in Sonoma County is almost five times higher among unvaccinated residents than in our vaccinated population. More than 80% of those COVID patients who are hospitalized, and more than 95% of those who end up critically ill in the intensive care units in our county, six hospitals are people who had the opportunity to be vaccinated, but chose not to be. It is important to note that regardless of vaccination status, the California Department of Public Health is requiring that all students from K through 12 in the state wear masks while on campus, as Dr. Harrington just discussed. This makes sense because masks are one of the easiest and most efficient tools available to all of us to prevent the transmission of COVID-19 infections and to support full-time in-person instruction in K-12 schools. Here in Sonoma County, we also have adopted a health order requiring masking once again in all indoor public locations, including stores, restaurants, and movie theaters. As I said, masks are a great tool, but they are no substitute for getting vaccinated. If you have not done so yet, please get the vaccination for yourself, for your child, and for your whole family. It's the most loving thing that you can do for your whole community. Beyond masking and vaccinating, there are many other protocols and practices that districts, schools, and classrooms can adopt to keep children, teachers, and staff safe. And we will be going over some of those today. Parents, no doubt, have many questions about the return to school. Like what happens if there's an outbreak in a class? Quarantine guidelines, options for parents who don't feel comfortable sending their child back to the classroom. We hope to answer these and other questions that you have today. But first, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Irmala Shende, Sonoma County's vaccine chief, to talk about the county's vaccination campaign. Thank you and do your best, get vaccinated if unvaccinated. That is really the best thing you can do right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mace. I'm happy to say that we continue to make progress in getting more people in our county vaccinated, but we still have a lot of work to do. At this point, seven out of every 10 people in our community are fully vaccinated, while about 8% of our population have received one shot and are awaiting their second dose. I'm happy to say that the fastest growing vaccinated group in Sonoma County is the 12 to 15 year old population, even though it's been less than three months since they became eligible to get the vaccine. This group is now 46% fully vaccinated and about 12% partially vaccinated. Among the 16 to 24 year olds, 59% are fully vaccinated and another 10% have been partially vaccinated. This is encouraging because it shows many school-aged children will be starting the school year with strong protection against the virus. It also shows, however, that we have a ways to go before all of these eligible students, 12 and older, have been vaccinated. If you have not yet gotten your vaccine or have not 
had your child vaccinated, please do so as soon as possible. Vaccines are safe, they are effective, and they are free. It's the best protection all of us against, uh, for all of us against experiencing the worst that the COVID virus has to offer. And we're seeing some of the very worst outcomes with this new variant, which is aggressive, highly contagious, and relentless. We'll continue to support SCO's vaccine clinics at school campuses around Sonoma County. For a current list of these free clinics, please visit sco.org slash vaccines. Here are some things to keep in mind about our school vaccine clinics. Anyone age 12 or older is eligible. Spanish translators are available. Um, please bring a photo ID with the child's date of birth as well as a medical and prescription insurance card if insured. Nobody will be turned away for lack of ID. Children under age 18 must have parental consent, whether that is in person or written or over the phone. Many people want to know when a vaccine will be available for children younger than 12. There are currently trials underway to test the vaccine in children aged five to 11 with data expected back this fall. That means that the US Food and Drug Administration could approve a vaccine for younger adolescents, uh, younger children as early as late December. That would be a welcome addition in our efforts to get the vaccine to all of our residents, but it's clear that we cannot plan on having a vaccine available for young children this fall. I look forward to answering your questions about the vaccine, but first I'd like to turn it over to Kate Pack from our epidemiology team to share some slides and some data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shende. I will briefly share some of the latest data on the cases and um, vaccination efforts in Sonoma County. Share my screen. Okay, um, so as you can see from this slide, um, over the past month or so, we have seen an incre increase in the new cases per 100,000 residents per day in the county. Um, we're currently at 19.5 new cases per 100,000 residents per day at 8% overall testing positivity. And that's 10.9% in the lowest healthy places index quartile. So that means the testing positivity in the areas of the community that tend to have least access to resources to support health. Um, and we've also seen hospitalizations increase. Um, we currently have 71 individuals hospitalized with COVID-19 in the county. And, and we have seen since in the past two months, 22 people have passed away from COVID-19 complications. <clears throat> As mentioned earlier in this press conference, we do have the Delta variant in Sonoma County. The CDC recently stated that 93% of all cases in the United States are the Delta variant. And we know that the Delta variant is highly transmissible and it's, we've seen it contribute to our increasing case numbers and the size of outbreaks that we've seen across sectors. This table is showing the genotyping that we've done locally with samples. And to date, we've seen 307 instances of the Delta variant in the genotyping that's been performed. Looking across the course of the pandemic, the impacts of COVID case numbers have not been equal by race and ethnicity group. We've seen a disproportionate impact relative to population size, looking at the number of cases per 100,000 population in Latinx, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Pacific Islander, Black, African American, Asian, and multiracial communities. And over the course of the entire pandemic, we've seen the most disproportionate impact in our Latinx community, with 61% of all COVID cases where we know what the race and ethnicity of the individual is. So 61% of all cases, but just making up 27.3% of the county population. Looking at our case rate by vaccination status, we see a disparity here where the most cases are occurring in those who are unvaccinated as compared to those who are fully vaccinated. In the unvaccinated population, we have a current case rate of 30, about 37 new cases per 100,000 per day as compared to about nine new cases per 100,000 per day in the fully vaccinated population. 
Looking at our hospitalizations, um, this chart is showing individuals hospitalized for COVID-19 since the start of the year to present. You can see that during April and May, we had a decrease in hospitalizations um, and reached an average of about 10 hospitalizations or so per day. And we are now up to over 70 hospitalizations. Over 80% of the hospitalizations and over 90% of the patients who are in the ICU for COVID-19 are unvaccinated. And we know that 99%, so 333 out of the 337 deaths that we've had in the county due to COVID-19 to date are among unvaccinated individuals. Looking at the age of new cases in the past 60 days, we have seen increased case numbers across all age groups, but cases remain most frequent in the 20 to 29 and 30 to 39 year old age groups. Looking at our vaccine administration, as Dr. Shende had mentioned, we are currently at 71% of the population fully vaccinated. And we know with variants um, such as Delta that being fully vaccinated is especially important to have effective um, protection um, and avoid the seri more serious consequences of hospitalization and death. Um, so this is really the number to watch, but we have 71% fully vaccinated and 8% partially vaccinated at this time among those who are age 12 and older. Looking by age group, we see that a gap still remains in the proportion of individuals aged 34 and younger who are fully vaccinated. So that's this dark brown color of bar um, as compared to these older age groups. So currently 46% of 12 to 15 year olds, 59% of 16 to 24 year olds and 61% of 25 to 34 year olds are fully vaccinated. Looking by race and ethnicity, we can see that a smaller proportion here looking at the dark blue representing fully vaccinated, a smaller proportion of individuals identifying as Latinx or multiracial um, are fully vaccinated as compared to other racial and ethnic groups. However, we are seeing progress um, being made, looking at weekly change in the numbers of individuals vaccinated. Um, we can see that between July 26 and August 2nd, 930 um, additional individuals became fully vaccinated who identified as Latinx, um, which was an increase of 1.8%. Looking at vaccine administration by Healthy Places Index quartile, we can see that 25%, so about a quarter of all vaccine doses have been administered to residents in the lowest quartile of the Healthy Places Index, in which residents have access to few, the fewest resources um, to be supporting their health. Um, and looking at that quartile in terms of proportion fully vaccinated and partially vaccinated, we can see that 69% of residents in this quartile are at least partially vaccinated with 61% being fully vaccinated. That's the end of the slideshow. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, that was great. So I think at this point, uh, we're right on time. Let's, let's move on to our questions from the public and to help us uh, moderate our discussion. We have Jamie Hansen. Jamie? All right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to all our panelists for the important information you've provided so far. We have received questions in advance over email, and we're receiving a number of questions from our audience tonight. So I thank everyone for their engagement. And we will get to as many of the questions as we can in the next half hour. So to start off, um, we have seen a number of questions from parents and community members about what happens exactly when a child is exposed to someone with COVID-19 at school, or if somebody becomes ill, what processes are in place to protect students and stop the spread? And I was hoping that someone from our uh, public health nurse team might be able to take that one. Laurel or Kira, would you be willing? Hi, Jamie, can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jenny, and I'm a nurse on the schools team for the Department of Public Health here in Sonoma County. Um, when a child is exposed to a positive COVID-19 case, right now we have a few different options for quarantine. If the exposure happens at school and the child is of K-12 age, so between grades kindergarten and 12, um, they are um, eligible for a modified quarantine if both of the case, the person who's infected and the contact, the other student are fully masked. So if that happens, the student can stay in school, um, remain in school for the 10 day quarantine period, but they should quarantine outside of school. And they do have to test two times weekly um, to be eligible for that um, option. Otherwise, if they're not masked, they can do a seven to 10 day quarantine at home. I hope that helps explain. <laughs> That's very helpful, thank you. And we had received a question specifically asking about whether students who were exposed need to be tested if they're coming back into the classroom and the answer is yes i think it's it's twice weekly requirement there so thank you for clarifying that and as a follow-up to um, that question if a student does have to stay home to quarantine or has to stay home because they are symptomatic there we have parents wondering what options are available for them to continue accessing their education during that time Dr. Harrington, would you be able to talk about what happens to a student from the educational perspective when they have to quarantine? Well, if they're enrolled in, in the school as a, in, for in-person instruction, there's, it doesn't change from a regular school sickness or absence. Homework can be sent home, products that the parent can pick that those type of assignments up. Uh, for those parents that are on social distancing or in uh, independent study, that doesn't change either. You're already out of the school setting and those type of assignments will continue. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. Uh, we have a lot of questions about what will happen if there is an outbreak at a school or a school sees a large number of COVID-19 cases. Last year, there were um, numbers and thresholds by which a school or a class would close if there were a number of cases within the, the school setting. Dr. Uh, Dr. Mace, would you be able to talk about how that has changed this year with the focus on really keeping children in school as much as possible and when we might still see a school closing because of COVID-19? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for that, Jamie. You know, I think I'm gonna have Dr. Lobato and his team talk about that since they're on the ground uh, dealing with this. Um, Dr. Lobato or Jenny or one of the nurses, could you speak to this? Hi, I can answer that. So um, if we have one or two cases in a classroom, we don't necessarily close the entire classroom down. We definitely do not close the entire school down. Um, at this time, we just go case by case basis. If um, any students were exposed, those people would need to quarantine if they were close contacts. Um, if we have a cluster of cases, we might look into it and see if they're all, if they all seem to be connected epidemiologically. So if we think that maybe transmission occurred in the classroom, we may end up having to close that classroom to take a step back and reassess. Um, if we have multiple classrooms with multiple um, outbreaks, so three or more cases in each class. We might have to close the school, but to be honest, we have not gotten to that point yet. Um, we have seen that schools can be a very safe place for children. There's not a lot of transmission occurring on site at schools. So we hope that this will continue um, into the new school year. Thank you. And if I can just add, we're gonna try to minimize the impact clearly on schools by really applying the contact tracing with those who were really exposed and trying to limit uh, the number of classrooms that might need to close, that kind of thing. And it depends on the school, the size of the school, the, 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 how many kids in each class. Uh, so there's a lot of different variables. So it's going to be sort of a case by case um, uh, decision making process. And Jamie, I'd like to follow up on Dr. Sun, uh, Dr. Mace's comment about minimize the context. Walking on a school campus and volunteering is not going to be an open process. But many schools are going to require that volunteers be vaccinated or show proof of a negative test to participate in a school setting. And once again, we'll, the school is a sheltered environment for that purpose. So it will be monitored by each of the offices 
and the COVID coordinators at that office. So people should not expect that they should have free access on a school campus because that gets into the idea of providing a sheltered environment. Thank you, Dr. Harrington and Jenny. While we're on, while I have you on the screen, Dr. Harrington, um, there are parents that are asking what options are available to them and their child if they're not ready to send them back for in-person learning or if they have concerns about the Delta variant. Well, I would say that they would, if I'm not, if I were a parent in a situation that I had concern about starting school right away with in-person instruction, I would contact my district and I would find out whether or not they are offering independent study as an option. And if not, where would I go? Who's, who have they made arrangements with? And if they haven't made any direct arrangements, I would ask for an inter-district agreement so I could attend a school of choice. Now, several of our larger districts have what we call online academies or programs, Katani Rona Park, Petaluma, and Santa Rosa. So they might wanna try one of those. Remember, you don't have to transport your student. You're just registering your student for an online program. And so that's what the option is for you. However, you have the flexibility if you're not on an inner district, let's say you just did a direct enrollment with somebody and you wanna come back to the district, the district needs to make some flexible changes within five days to accommodate you coming back into the school setting. There needs to be a parent teacher conf a parent school conference regarding the transfer of the student back in. And if you wish to leave, there needs to be a parent teacher conference on what your options might be. So once again, it's very important to complete the survey instrument. It's very important to talk to your current school office and ask what arrangements you can make. Thank you, Dr. Harrington. I know it will be helpful for parents to know they do have some options if they're feeling concerned about coming back. And speaking of concern, we are getting a lot of questions about the Delta variant and what this means for schools and children's safety. So I'm hoping now to pass it over to our team of doctors to just talk about what we do know at this point about the Delta variant and how it affects children. I know there's a lot of news about there being an increase in hospitalization rates. So it would be great to just know, you know, what are the facts at this point about how the Delta variant affects children and how can schools take um, measures to protect against this new strain? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so the Delta variant is probably the predominant variant that we're seeing now in Sonoma County. In fact, of the genotyping or when we're looking at different strains, the majority of the strains that are showing up are definitely the, Del the Delta variant. We are not uh, testing all the different um, cases for which kind of variant they have. So it's probably a little bit biased towards more likely finding the Delta variant because we're testing people in the hospital or who are sick in the ICU or who get COVID even though they're vaccinated. So those folks are probably more likely to have it. What we do know about the Delta variant is that it's more transmissible from person to person about 60% more transmissible. That just means that it's more likely that if you're exposed to it, you're gonna get it. Now, um, the vaccine still from many of the studies that have been done are quite effective against this variant. So if you're vaccinated, you are less likely to get COVID still, even with the new variant. However, we have been seeing as Kate just presented more cases among, amongst fully vaccinated persons. Uh, generally, people who are fully vaccinated are not getting as sick and ending up in the hospital or the ICU, uh, or of course, uh, the worst outcome death as those who are unvaccinated. How does this affect kids? Well, we know that kids uh, get COVID as well, and they can be more likely to be asymptomatic. The Delta variant is more transmissible, and probably that is the case for kids to get COVID through the Delta variant as well. We do have our pediatrician here, however, who is the subject matter expert. So I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Shende to potentially uh, uh, to discuss what she's seeing from the pediatrician side in terms of Delta variant in kids. Thanks, Dr. Mace. So we know that the Delta variant does seem to have a little bit more symptoms, uh, symptomatology in children. That being said, in Sonoma County, we've done well. The best protection against COVID and the Delta variant is to have more of the population vaccinated. If that's the case, then there's less chance for that Delta variant to spread and to affect children. Um, 
in general, uh, children with COVID, they do fine. We are seeing a little more in the way of fever uh, in kids who have the Delta variant, but for the most part, uh, they, they do quite well. Um, again, the best protection is to make sure everybody in the household is protected against it. Because as Dr. Harrington mentioned earlier, and as we've, we've mentioned uh, during this presentation, children for the most part do not contract the infection at school. They can contract it at, how, at home and from large and small gatherings. So the more of a protective bubble that we can create around that child, the less chance that that child is going to, to become ill from COVID. Um, and again, at this point in Sonoma County, we haven't had any children who have had severe complications uh, from COVID. Uh, they've done quite well. And if I can just add uh, quickly, the reason for the mask man mandate indoors in schools is specifically because we have the younger kids under 12 who aren't vaccinated. And we know that masks are incredibly effective against the transmission of COVID-19. So even more reason, if your child is unvaccinated, to ensure that we really do follow that mask mandate, especially when indoors, um, as the state has required. And Dr. Mace, as a follow-up to that, we did get some questions about what do we know about how effective masking is against the Delta variant in particular? Uh, do we have any data to show how effective masking is at stopping the spread of that variant? Well, we know that masking is, over the course of a year and a half, we've gained a lot of data now showing that masking is extremely effective in preventing person-to-person -person transmission of COVID. Um, now, the type of mask does make a difference. We do know that the, you know, sort of medical grade respirators and then medical grade masks, like the blue surgical mask or uh, uh, the N95 respirators are more effective in preventing transmission, but cloth, ma cloth masks have been proven to be quite effective as well. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure, Dr. Shende, do you know, or Dr. Obato or someone else, and whether Delta specifically has any different data in terms of um, transmission, in terms of the use of masks? I don't think there's a difference with Delta. I think in general, as we know, the thicker the weave, the more layers that are contained within that mask, then the more effective that mask is going to be at both preventing spread outwards and uh, spread inwards. So a, a high quality mask is recommended. So likely no difference between the former variant, this variant, or you know, different strains of COVID in terms of transmissibility and mask. The most important thing is probably modeling at home and uh, ensuring that children wear masks. And we know that children can follow rules. They really can. Um, so the more that we encourage that at home, the more that we uh, demonstrate that at home um, so that kids see adults and older children in the household wearing masks, the more likely they are to do that and uh, the safer they're going to be. Thank you, Dr. Shende. And so we've talked about how the two most important tools that we have right now are vaccines and masking. In regard to the 12 and under population, there's a lot of interest in, in when the vaccine will be available for those children so that we can add that additional layer of protection for them. Do we have any insight or information about when that vaccine might be available to our, our elementary school age population? Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a big question these days. We don't have any guarantee as to exactly when it's going to be available. We do know that uh, the studies are underway and they expect to be uh, uh, submitting that data um, to the FDA for evaluation in September. It will probably take another month or two. So most estimates are that in November or December, there should be a vaccine available for the five to 11 aged population. Thank you. And we um, continue to get questions about the concern about the high case rates and why there is not a distance learning option available or when that might be available. And uh, so Dr. Harrington, I was wondering if you could talk for a little bit about what the state's reasoning was in not in directing schools not to offer a distance learning option and rather go with the independent study alternative instead. Well, a distance learning option created hybrid classes and hybrid schedules, which made it very difficult for parents to go back to work. And that was the primary motivator for the state legislature to put that in, was that they wanted the public and the general public uh, and the economy for California to continue to grow. So that's why we don't have a hybrid model, is the social distancing forced or created 
um, smaller classes, and you couldn't run a student pop, run school with a full population base. So that the, the universal masking was the solution to that problem uh, from California Department of Public Health. Okay, thank you for that. All right, going to our school, our public health nurse team, we have more questions about how a school will respond if there is a case or an outbreak on campus. And in particular, what are the recommendations for cleaning and sanitation at the school site if there's been an exposure? Hi, Jamie. Um, so if there is a positive case confirmed that was on site at a school, Right now, it's pretty simple. The recommendation from the state is to, um, if they were on site within 24 hours of um, that time, then they should do full disinfection and cleaning of the area where that case spent most of their time. So that includes high touch surfaces and their own personal desk, um, any areas like that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, and going back to Dr. Harrington for a minute, we, we have questions again about um, this, this distance learning question, and there's an understanding that there might be some school districts offering distance learning. Um, I believe what they are offering instead is a fully online school, uh, but is there any light you can shed on that and, you know, on, basically online charter schools and other types of offerings that might be available? Well, first of all, there is no distance learning. so they would be online enrolled charter schools, which we have several in this county run by districts. So you could, you could en enroll in any one of those during this time period and, and each particular online academy or virtual academy is set up differently. So I was, it's a matter of checking out the different districts and what they're doing and how they're offering instruction. Um, there is a component requirement for some synchronous instruction. So they need to see how many minutes are set aside for that at each school site, it might be different. But uh, for those that are offering online academies or online charter schools, they need to know that. Now, what I should, should have made clear is a charter school does not have to give parents an option. That's just by, they, they may choose to give parents an option, but charter schools are not required to. Public schools are required to give parents an option either to go to another district or to enroll in another program. And of course, private schools, well, they can just follow the rules and not have to make an option. So that's not a requirement for them. So all of that's uh, a little double talk there, but it, it's basically because of the difference, the nuanced difference between charter schools, private schools, and public schools. Thank you. Um, we've got some question about social distancing and recommendations about um, whether to eat indoors or outdoors. I'm wondering if um, Adam Radke or someone from the, the public health nurse team could just talk about what this, the guidance from the California Department of Public Health tells us as far as how schools should be um, basically setting up to, uh, lunch in a, in a COVID friendly way. Can respond to this one. Hi, this is Laurel. I'm one okay. of the public health nurses. Right. Um, so basically the guidance recommends mas maximizing the physical distancing as much as possible when eating, especially indoors. Some sites may even opt to have assigned seating for eating. Um, it's always recommended that mealtime occurs outdoors as much as possible. And then when it comes to food service recommendations, it's also recommended that you clean frequently touched surfaces, and that surfaces that come in contact with food should be washed, rinsed, and sanitized before and after meals. Um, and so there's no longer that, you know, approach to single use items due to the lower incidence of seeing COVID transmitted from surfaces. Um, so that's basically the new update in the guidance. And I would like to add, JB, that, you know, we've really encouraged districts to be flexible in their lunch programs. Uh, if you are able by facility, remember each district is gonna be different because their facilities are different. So some districts have flexibility and they can offer an inside and outside lunch. Some lunches are covered, so they have shelter and they may even do that through the winter period. But it's, it all depends on the facility, its capability, how many lunches they serve in a, a lunch period, the size of the cafeteria, all of that um, plays into what the district chooses to do. 
Um, we have always told our employees, we will we'll call social, we call it what social distancing. Three feet is a respectable social distancing. And we try to encourage that in our classroom settings wherever possible, but it's not always possible. We know that. So once again, uh, the, double, the, the double mask uh, thickness as well as universal masking is always encouraged. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go over to a sports related question. I know that we have sports um, gearing up. And so we have people wondering what will happen if there's a positive case on a sports team? How is that handled from a contact tracing and, um, and the perspective of just trying to limit the impact? I'm wondering if our um, public health nurse team might be able to take that. Hi, everyone. I can answer this one. My name is Aaliyah. You know, it says Kira there. Um, I'm also a nurse on the Sonoma County Department of Public Health team. Um, so we anticipate shortly that the state will release further guidance directly, specifically addressing sports teams. At this time, a lot of sports teams are considered a high contact exposure. So for the most part, usually their quarantine is a 10 to 14 day quarantine. So also, I'd like to add to this question too, Jamie. The definition of high contact sports has not changed. So last year's definitions are still in place. In the loop, as, as Kara, Kara talked about, we're waiting for the new guidance. But remember, we have many uh, activities which are considered extracurricular. Choral music is one of those. Uh, I know we've talked about Woodwind instruments happen to be another high frequency. So you have to look at the guidance currently. They identify um, high, what I would call high, high needs or basically concerns that are in the uh, extracurricular activities. We are waiting for modified guidance. It's supposed to come out this week. But in lieu of that, schools are currently practicing under the old rules. Now, if a team member gets uh, has an active case, if you're vaccinated, I believe, and the nurses can back me up on this, the students that are vaccinated are still eligible to play. And, and Dr. Shindy, I think we talked about that. That was one of the biggest things. We are really encouraging athletic teams to get their vaccines if they're age eligible, because they don't have the restrictions put on them like they did last year. They would have more flexibility. So uh, I, I, I think I'm correct on that one. Dr. Shindy, do you have anything to add to that? No, nope, nothing to add. I don't know if the, the school nurses who've been working with these situations, if they have anything else to add, but, but no, I, I think uh, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are getting close to the end of the hour here. So I wanna see if we can get a couple more questions in before we close. And one question that I'm seeing pop up a lot is questions about um, teacher and school staff vaccines and uh, whether or not a, a family member or a parent has the right to know whether their teacher is vaccinated, if vaccinations will be required at any point for school staff. Um, Dr. Harrington, would you like to start us out there and, and then maybe we can have a conversation with you and Dr. Mace on this? Well, first of all, asking the question of are you vaccinated is not a violation of anyone's HIPAA rights. I need to make that really clear. You can ask that question. Now, you don't get to go on beyond that question, but basically they can choose to answer that or not. Um, for me, I have no problem saying that I'm fully vaccinated. You know, and we have here at SCO, Sonoma County Office of Education, we have a 95% vaccination rate of our employee group. Now, each district has their own vaccination rate. We hosted, uh, through Dr. Shindy's cooperation and Dr. Mace's cooperation, vaccination clinics for all school-based school employees. Now there are 17,000 in this county and we covered within our own vaccination clinics close to 13,000 people. We either did it with an online support system or an actual online vaccination, our, uh, our own personal vaccination clinic of 9,000 people. So that contact, we've done, we have a very high percentage of our school-based employees vaccinated. I would estimate it to be around 85% based on the number of vaccines administered to the K-12 population that is served. 
uh, and I'm talking K-12 employee population. Um, I'll let Dr. Mace or Dr. Shundi ask answer anything else as it relates to that. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I really applaud the uh, Sonoma County Office of Education's efforts in getting their staff vaccinated. It was an incredible uh, effort and clearly very successful. So um, I don't have any more uh, to add that, you know, as of now, we don't have a mandate for uh, teachers or anybody else really in Sonoma County to get vaccinated. We do have some uh, high risk groups that need to provide proof of vaccination. But this time there isn't a mandate. It is a, a vaccine that's still under an emergency use authorization and hopefully soon will be fully um, uh, cleared by the FDA for use without emergency use. Uh, Dr. Shandy, do you wanna add anything else? The only other thing I wanted to add is uh, to what Dr. Harrington said. Um, SCO did a great job. Uh, we, we were able to uh, help out a bit and and uh, to set up those clinics. And similarly, uh, clinics are being offered for um, those age 12 and up. And there are many of them happening alongside orientations this week. And going forward into the month of August and early September, we will continue to offer clinics on campus to make it easier for uh, not only students, but also for their families. It's not only for the kids, but it's really to be expanded to uh, the entire family. Um, and uh, I had mentioned before that uh, all the, the information about the clinics can be found on sco.org slash vaccine. You can also find it on our website at socoemergency.org slash vaccine. Um, Dr. Shindy too, I think uh, one of the things that I think uh, is more flexible now than when we started, we had to make appointments, but I think you can do walk-ins, is that correct? Is that the absolutely. way we're running the clinics? That's absolutely right. Every clinic, uh, uh, most people are actually walking in to make it easier. Um, and most of the clinics are offered uh, in the evenings. Uh, some of them are all day during the daytime, but also we're offering some evening clinics. And going forward, once school starts, we will offer weekend clinic hours as well, Saturdays. Fantastic. So I think our last question of the night will be about testing. It, this is another important tool in the tool belt alongside vaccination and masking. And we have some parents who want to do the right thing and, and have their children tested. And they're just wondering the best way to do this. They're wondering if this is something their school will be providing. Um, Dr. Harrington, could you talk about whether schools are required to provide testing, whether um, they, they will be providing testing? And then maybe we can go over to the county to talk about about what other testing options are available for any community member. Well, I do know that when a student uh, shows symptoms, we recommend testing, and we do have a countywide testing sites available so parents could take their child for testing. I'll let the doctors talk about that. Um, many of the districts receive federal funds so they could buy testing kits, especially if they have an exposure. So once they have an exposure on site, it's recommended we have testing, and I know the nurses have a regimen for which kids are tested and how many days they're tested, but it is not required. It's recommended that you make testing available, and you can use your funds for that purpose. I know that we at SCO, for our classes, we have our PCR testing kits ready to go, and we are testing our own employees, even vaccinated employees, we're making an offer of every 10 days because a vaccinated employee can still carry uh, the virus. So we want to make sure that we're not ex making any, putting anybody at risk. Uh, Dr. Mace or Dr. Shundi about, about the uh, testing? Yeah, you know, I think I'm going to turn this over to uh, either the school nurse team or Dr. Lobato, who may know um, specifically what our recommendations are for testing. Besides response testing, that is. Um, I can speak a little bit about yeah. our current testing options. Um, so we are, maybe some schools have already utilized this, but we do have a testing team that can be available on site if the school doesn't have testing on site. Um, and that is something that your school's COVID coordinator would speak to um, us, the public health nurses here about, and we would help them set that up. Um, the recommendations for when testing should occur kind of depend on which quarantine protocol we're going with. As Jenny previously speaks about the modified quarantine, the testing looks different for that than at the been doing an at-home quarantine. But once again, this is something that would be coming from your school's COVID coordinator. They're the ones who are going to communicate the proper testing windows for your child. 
Okay, thank you for that very helpful information. And I, I see that we're at five o'clock here, so I wanna respect everyone's time. I'm gonna pass it back over to my colleague, Paul at the county to see if we have any um, anything else to wrap yeah. up? We thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And before we sign off, I just wanted to see if any of our media partners had any questions they wanted to ask. Um, they could just raise their hand uh, if they did. Otherwise, I know we've covered a great deal of information tonight. And I do want to I do want to thank all of our panelists um, for, for joining us today. I'll, I would also like to thank the crew who helped put this uh, webinar together, including Juan, our Spanish interpreter, and May, our ASL interpreter. We do want to remind everyone that this session has been recorded and will be posted on the Sonoma County Office of Education webpage, as well as on the Sonoma County Facebook and YouTube pages. So please uh, share this link with your friends and family members. This was important information tonight. We also want to remind you that we will be repeating this webinar in Spanish this Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, for now, uh, we want to encourage you, as Dr. Shende mentioned, that uh, to go to socoemergency.org slash vaccine for any information on the vaccine itself and clinics, or go to sco.org slash vaccines to learn more about SCO vaccination clinics and school reopenings. And um, with that, I think we will call it a night. We wish you all to have a great week and to stay safe. Thank you for joining us.